Um, so welcome, this panel is around uh, disability and cycling, making uh, bike advocacy truly inclusive. Um, I have to say, putting together this panel, which um, put together a lot of them, so um, it took some work, um, but out of all the panels, I guess, in the summit, I would say this panel is what I have most to learn from. Um, as an able-bodied person, cyclist, it never occurs to me um, about what disabled folks, disabled cyclists in, in general um, work with in our infrastructure, our, our everyday lives. And I just learned so much just setting up this conversation with you three um, that I just feel like I have so much more, more to learn. Um, and I feel, yeah, really honored that you all were able to be here virtually. Um, and um, I think that's it for me. So we're just gonna do short 15 minute presentations um, starting off with Megan first, then Maddie, um, then Anna, and if Tiffany shows up, we can um, have her, and then I'll just be um, moderating some questions to each of them and then open it up to, to all of you at the end for Q&A. So thank you all for being here, you as well, and Megan, you wanna take us away? Sure, uh, sure. let me just uh, test you for, for a second. I switched, I switched, switched my, switched to my headphones. headphones, hopefully that makes hopefully things better. better. I'm still getting, I'm still getting, it. getting an echo. echo. Okay, okay, all right. All well, right. I, will well try I will try to ignore the echo. The <laughs> uh, my name is Megan Lynch. I am the founder of UC Access Now, which is a loose coalition of students, staff, and faculty working to dismantle ableism throughout the University of California. Uh, what you can see there is my very first bike, which is a Schwinn Little Chick, which I rode before I became disabled in 1995. Um, because the public conversation about ableism is much younger than that about other systemic oppressions, I thought I'd start out with a definition of ableism that I think is good. It's by Talila T. L. Lewis uh, that was uh, put together in conversation with disabled black and other negatively racialized folk, especially Dustin Gibson. And it, uh, I guess I should start also by saying that I'll be giving visual descriptions of, of the uh, photos and illustrations here, just you know, for anybody who's blind or low vision. On the right, there is a photo uh, from 1884 of two men on the steps of the Capitol. One is uh, riding a high wheeler uh, bicycle down the steps of the Capitol. Uh, ableism is a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence, excellence, and productivity. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in anti-blackness, eugenics, colonialism, and capitalism. This form of systemic oppression leads to people in society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's appearance and or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce, excel, and quote unquote behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. And like a lot of other systemic oppressions, this is stuff that we're just sort of soaking in all the time. We get raised with it from the time we're young. So as much as you may not think that you uh, have any tendencies towards ableism, you do just as you do towards other systemic oppressions. It's something that we have to actively work to dismantle. So cycling is not immune from this either. Uh, it has been part of systemic oppressions in the past. Cycling can liberate, but when we live in curiarchy, we have to actively dismantle oppressive systems to make cycling, cycling liberatory. And the illustration here is a photo of Los Angeles' East Side Cycling Club. Every single person there is a white man. <laughs> They're all dressed in the club uniform, except for two uh, folks dressed in business suits. Um, the photo here is the same U.S. Capitol. Uh, this is from March 12, 1990. It's a photo of the Capitol crawl, which was one of the protests uh, that activists engaged in that uh, eventually cu culminated in the signing of ADA into law. And there's really nothing more symbolic than the fact that the very center of our government is, is you don't have ramps to our government, you have stairs. <laughs> um, so disability is just part of the human experience. Um, most of us will be disabled temporarily or permanently at some point in our lives. Uh, Pre-pandemic figures were that 26% of people uh, have at least one disability, and we know that as a result of this pandemic, uh, many more people have been disabled by this pandemic. Um, disabled pe people's needs are not special, uh, even though they're often labeled as such because that allows it to be something that they consider extra and don't budget for. Our needs are needs. Um, we're not other, we're you. 
you know, you in the future at some point, we are human. Uh, it's part of the spectrum of the human experience. Um, so when you're not including us, you're limiting the reach of cycling as much as car centric people do. Both car centrists and cyclists uh, as communities are ableist. And they use disabled people as a cudgel in arguments without including us in meaningful ways. And so I sort of made a meme medic here. Uh, <laughs> you've got a game of keep away and, and the person tossing the ball says, not everyone can ride bikes. What about disabled people? The person they're tossing the ball to says, not everyone can drive. E-bikes are more affordable than a car. And meanwhile, the ball just keeps going over the head of actual disabled people. The mic never gets past us. <laughs> it, we're, it, people are doing things about us uh, and quote unquote for us, but not involving us. So I thought I'd start here with just a selection of the different kinds of cycles that disabled people ride. On the left hand side there, you have a, uh, a hand cycle. Uh, you have your, you know, kind of typical adult uh, tricycle with a, with a grocery cart on it. There's a, uh, a monotube recumbent bicycle on the bottom left is, th this is a rising uh, popular device. It's sort of a aftermarket add-on that you can add to your manual wheelchair, which will turn it into an e-trike. Uh, there's a standard tandem there, but the thing here is that the, the person steering it is sighted and the person who's the stoker is blind. Uh, and then at the bottom also is this cargo quadricycle, which uh, I ride. This is just a selection. There's like actually many, many, many different cycle frames that there are out there. So here we are with, on the top right is a sort of um, photo you would commonly see on Twitter and other social media talk, extolling the virtues of, of you know, Amsterdam and Copenhagen and other places that people um, hold up as, as being, you know, sort of ideals. And they are much, much better than most of the US is, but if you, if you hold this up as an ideal without actually noticing that this infrastructure will not accommodate the uh, the cycle designs that I just showed. Um, so, and that's, you know, it's not that you can't show photos of things that are where the people are doing better than we are, but hold up as the ultimate goal because you need to develop eyes to see that this is not accessible. And towards the top right there is another rack where it's like, it's not gonna fit those cycle designs. And furthermore, it requires people to have the strength to lift them up onto that rack. And I know I don't have that strength anymore. <laughs> um, there's a LA dot uh, rack there. They just were talking about the fact that you can now fit three bikes on, but it's only three bikes of a certain frame. And then the other two photos there are from UC Davis and uh, the catalyzing event for the foundation of UC Access Now, there's many, many ableist things there's systemic ableism throughout UC and we're working on that. So there's lots and lots of different issues we work on, but the catalyst, the thing that made me form it was the fact that the inaccessible bike racks here were hurting me. I mean, literally, I fell over several times while I was trying to, to lock my bike to them. Uh, I have a, a condition that affects my hands and uh, the act of trying to make my bike somehow fit onto these racks. I can only park on the very end spot if it happens to be open. And even that was really hard. And, and it was making it so that I wasn't gonna be able to type, which is crucial for me to be able to do the work that I came here to do. Uh, so I tried to work through channels to get that changed. And it was just so difficult just trying to be the good girl because they were saying, you know, other people are like, well, just lock it up somewhere else. But UC Davis Taps uh, will ticket or impound your bike and they impound lots of bikes and sell them off and I can't afford to replace my bike. So you're, cu cu you're stuck between a rock and a hard place here. So you can see here that you've got, most of those racks are what's called a lightning bolt design. And then you can see this like space looking thing here. <laughs> and that's even worse because it's got an outer shell. So you really, you have to have a certain size and shape of bike. And they're, you know, at the same time they're telling me Bikes aren't covered under ADA. Bikes, you know, we need to fit everything really close together. We can't afford this, but they'll spend money on that like special space looking thing. And then the one on the right, I wanted to point out here because it's even doubly worse there. The way they've sided the racks, not only are the racks inaccessible, but you're making it difficult for people in wheelchairs to get past that also inaccessible outdoor furniture. <laughs> so it's really pretty bad. Um, <clears throat> Here's an example from the UK of a chicane and a path. This is another problem that disabled cyclists experience a lot when they use. And by the way, I, I should say also, there are disabled cyclists who use regular upright frames. There definitely are. But 
a lot of disabled cyclists are more likely to use these other type of frame designs and these things that are meant to keep out cars and ATVs also keep us out. Here's an example here of, of you know, somebody's really excited about this, this uh, Highlander uh, train. Uh, and, and it is definitely an improvement on like what we have here in the States. But when somebody here asked about the, uh, the cycle that they have, uh, <laughs> and I just realized now I haven't put it in presentation mode, have I? <laughs> so everybody's seeing this on the side. I'm sorry about that. Um, we got a Christiania bike, and they were ask, asking about it, and somebody showed them this example from Denmark where you've got a much more modular setup so that you could have a lot of different kinds of, of frame designs, including it's also shared with strollers and wheelchairs. Um, so when something's inaccessible, I think a lot of people will think, well, oh, that's too bad, right? You know, but you, you'll get over it. It, it. Next time you'll find something better. But the problem is, is that the is a single act of denial of accessibility can really have serious consequences for disabled people. And for me, it's been very serious. It's really hurt my health in, in a, a huge way. So, um, you know, I gained weight and the pro reason that was a problem for me is that I, you know, for, for my particular body, I am actually over what is healthy for me. But furthermore, it means that the bike I'd already paid for, paid off, I'm now over its weight rating. And I now have to spend money to get a new bike. I lost fitness and then, this, and then the pandemic happened. And then I didn't, not only did that have me entering the pandemic, in a way where I was in lower health and less resilient, but it also limited my exercise opportunities during the pandemic because the, <clears throat> the public areas were full of maskless people. And if I'd been able to cycle, at least I would have been able to get further away from folks. So it was a really serious thing and I'm still experiencing the effects of it. I, I think unfortunately, uh, some are never gonna not be with me now. <clears throat> so there, it's not all bad news. There is some good news. I first um, got a recumbent in 1995. It was not that easy to find them. It was not that easy to get a selection to try out. There are more different frame designs available now than ever before. That increase in supply has made it slightly more affordable to people downstream uh, because, you know, as people move on, then used bikes enter the market and also there's more competition. Um, the ableist attitude about e-bikes being cheating is almost nearly disappeared now, and uh, it's also easier to find people than it used to be. So here's a, uh, you know, I'm kind of going through these very quickly because I, I don't want to go over my time. But here's a to-do list. If you're in a cycle coalition or if you're in a, a cycle advocacy position, uh, actually the, the, first, the first two here really apply to everybody, which is your communications need to be accessible. So, you know, look these things up because I don't have the detail to get into it now, but if you've got images on HTML back to things, you need alt text and image description. You need captions, open captions on things, and you need to use plain language so that people who have intellectual disabilities can, you know, not have to struggle with awkward or, or complex language. Make all your events accessible. This includes an equitable online experience. So not just throwing things online, but like if you have networking events in person, why not you know, why are you not putting together an online networking experience? Um, there should be frequent breaks. Your venues, of course, should be wheelchair accessible at the least, uh, you know, ASL interpreters, captions. Any bike friendly awards, your criteria must include accessibility. Remember how I was telling you about UC Davis's uh, Rex? UC Davis has the, the uh, platinum bike friendly rating. So clearly nobody was looking at whether it's actually a decent place for disabled cyclists um, or healthy place for us to be quite honest. So uh, photos and illustrations, I pulled this off of the Silicon Valley uh, Bike Coalition website, uh, but there are lots of other coalition bikes websites that are the same. You generally see um, thin people riding upright bikes and that and there's nothing against, I used to be one of those, but <laughs> but it's nice to show a more, a broader variety. And even while I was getting together uh, photos for this, I think there's a real need for for more creative commons and stock uh, uh, photo in this, because even, even what I was pulling from creative commons and also pictures I've my, I myself have taken, you know, it is mostly white folks too. So it, it needs to be more uh, uh, diverse than it is. Um, seek out uh, disabled cyclists when defining your priorities. We have issues that need lobbying. 
and the, nobody's helping us. And so UC Access Now has a tool, uh, which I will link to at the end. Um, please, uh, it allows you to, to write uh, the governor, the chancellors, and the Board of Regents uh, about the UC Access Now issues, including this accessible cycle infrastructure issue, which is really huge for us. And no, very few people within the cycling community have uh, taken that action to support us. Um, stop the obesity crisis framing. It's, it's ableist, it's luxist, it deputizes people to attack people based on their looks, and it's just not good. So when you take funding from organizations that have that as their, their uh, mission and, and, it, and it forces you into that framing, it's just very, very bad. Don't do it, please. Um, invite disabled people, pay us to speak <laughs> and share our experience. And if you're in the industry here, um, CycleShare needs to include adaptive cycles, not as a special program, but integrated with all the hubs. If anybody needs convenience, it's disabled people. Um, cycle pods need to have accessible infrastructure if you're making like a transit hub, if you're making these sort of like larger store or storage locker kind of things, those have to be accessible. Park needs to create mech stands that work with a variety of cycles. When I get my uh, recumbent bike to be fixed, when I bring in my cargo quad, they can't fit it in their stand. And so they have to go through all gyrations, which makes them not want to work on my bike. Um, make cycle clothing and cycles that fit fat people and or have adaptive designs make accessories and infrastructure that work for frame designs other than upright bikes and um, make the info on the max weight rating for your cycle easy to find when i had that problem i've twice now since going to school have experienced really bad ableist incidents that caused health problems for me and it made my weight go up and then I couldn't tell whether my bike was safe for me to ride anymore because the information about the frame rating was really hard to find. So that's it for me. Um, <laughs> this here link tree, UC Access Now, uh, will send you to links for all my stuff. The bit.ly link here is how to go specifically to our action tool. The, and uh, Megan Understrike Gun, <laughs> May Understrike Gun and Access UC are where we are on Twitter. Um, thank you so much. And that's be it for sharing this. <laughs> The um, it, you're muted, Jared. We can't hear you. Hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Great. <laughs> As I was saying, Megan, thank you so much for presenting. I definitely have some follow-up questions. Um, I was just saying your wake-up call to me every time um, that we communicate about this. And as you mentioned, you know, to me early on in you know, disability justice as, as a topic, as a movement is, you know, still in its infancy, and it's still young. Um, and I think being at Cal Bike, you know, and everything you just mentioned about the to-do list is like just something that, is, something that needs to be prioritized ASAP. So um, I look forward to asking you some more questions soon. Um, thank you for the presentation again. And Maddie, please, you're next. Great, thank you so thank much, you Jared. So much Jared. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I am hearing I am hearing oh, oh, so maybe if maybe you're able to you're able to mute. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I mostly have photos to share today. Um, but um, I will begin by introducing myself. So um, hey everyone, uh, my name is Maddie Rublo. I'm a transportation planner on the accessible services team at the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Um, I was also recently appointed as a public member to the US Access Board, which is a federal agency um, that sets guidelines and regulations um, for access on a variety of topics. Um, and so I'm here today uh, to talk to you about a couple of things. First and foremost, about our adaptive bike share program in San Francisco. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about how we've done some work to design bike lanes that work for disabled pedestrians, and then share a little bit about my personal experience. Um, and this is all sort of coming from um, the work that we've been trying to do to really build bridges um, between cyclists and disabled folks. Um, as Megan said, people often pit bike and disability communities against each other. Um, I think we are very much stronger together, but there's a lot to learn. And I think um, disabled cyclists and work around accessibility 
um, is sort of at the crux of that and how we can sort of build coalitions um, for safer streets and better infrastructure. Um, so one way, of course, to build coalitions is to center the value of inclusive access and um, to expand cycling for disabled people. Um, so um, I'm going to share uh, throughout the presentation um, some photos of um, adaptive bike share, and I will be, as Megan did, providing image descriptions for accessibility. Um, so this first photo is of a cyclist uh, using a recumbent hand cycle. Um, and um, this is uh, a photo from our adaptive bike share program. And so a little bit about how this program came to be. Um, this came initially out of advocacy efforts from folks in the disability community. Uh, she started in the East Bay. Um, there's a really strong history of disability advocacy in uh, the Bay Area and in the East Bay in particular. Um, and uh, city staff um, started hearing from um, disabled folks who said, you know, you have this new bike share program, but disabled people aren't included. You know, what, what happened to equivalent service and equal access? Um, and so out of that, uh, there was a technical advisory committee formed and um, there were pilots, sort of twin pilots in Oakland and in San Francisco that started a couple of years ago. And so in San Francisco, the Adaptive Bike Share Program initially launched in July of 2019. Um, it's a collaboration between um, an adaptive recreation program called BORP, Bay Area Outreach and Recreation, um, SFMTA, MTC, uh, San Francisco uh, Rec Park, and um, Bay Wheels slash Lyft. Um, and uh, the pilot uh, ran in 2019. It was initially uh, slated to come back in 2020, and then the pandemic happened, and so the pilot continuation uh, happened last year in 2021. Um, and let's see a little bit about how this program is structured. Um, so BORP, uh, the Adaptive Cycling Organization, um, they're the staff on the ground. And so every week um, they would have five different types of adaptive cycles available for free in Golden Gate Park for anybody to ride. Um, they also had other adaptive equipment um, such as uh, different seats and straps um, and lifts to help people transfer from mobility devices to um, the adaptive cycles. They also are experts in helping people transfer and helping fit people to adaptive bikes. Um, and importantly, they were able to keep an eye on someone's uh, mobility device while they were riding an adaptive cycle. As I'll get into a little bit more, that's one of the sort of key challenges that we're trying to work through when you think about different models for adaptive bike share is that if somebody is a wheelchair user and then they're going to transfer to an adaptive cycle, um, they need somewhere to store their wheelchair. And so uh, here, board staff were able to do that and also keep an eye on any service animals if, if somebody was going to a cycle um, in the park. Um, we got really positive feedback from riders. Um, and um, and I, I should say, so here, here's a photo um, of, and I, so I, all this, the slides all have titles for accessibility reasons. So that way, when somebody goes back, if they're using a screen reader, um, they're able to identify each slide. And so sometimes we have to make um, aesthetic compromises um, ultimately to get the best accessibility. Um, but here's a photo of two people using um, a, a tandem adaptive cycle um, in the park. Um, and so let's go on maybe to this next photo. Um, and we have here um, somebody using a recumbent hand cycle as well. Um, and so we have really positive feedback from riders on this adaptive bike share program. Um, we did a survey evaluations and people rated the program 4.75 stars out of five. Um, people talked about how meaningful the program was. Um, for them and people who didn't realize that they could cycle had the opportunity to try cycling again. Um, we also heard, and this is sort of getting back to the idea of coalitions, um, that people who uh, were using the Adaptive Bike Share Program were also very in favor of keeping uh, JFK Drive in Golden Gate Park uh, closed to cars. And so I think there is that sort of nexus there between um, disabled cyclists also wanting uh, safe streets and uh, finding community there among other disabled cyclists. Um, and so uh, going on, here's another photo of um, 
a, a wheelchair user uh, using an electric wheelchair, and then um, a person using an upright hand cycle. Um, and uh, here, here are those rider reactions. So some quotes that I will read. So somebody said, I learned that I can bike again. I used a tandem cycle for the first time. Uh, somebody who responded and said, keep it going. Uh, somebody who spoke about return to functionality from before their uh, CI injury, like having more independence. Uh, that's, sorry, that's a spinal cord injury. Um, spoke about being able to strengthen their arms. Uh, yeah, we heard from people who said that this was a good complement to physical therapy programs, uh, that it was a good family outing, and somebody simply said that they love it. Um, and, you know, we also, we heard from people who said that they were interested potentially in buying adaptive cycles for themselves, but there weren't really good opportunities to try out, you know, they wanted to be able to try out something before they invested a lot of money in this. And so this program, because it's free, um, really gave people the opportunity um, to try uh, different, different types of cycles. Um, and so our next steps with this program, um, we're doing a formal evaluation um, and we're working with partners to figure out how we can continue offering something that people really love. And then we're also working to expand the ridership. We, we had um, you know, riders over the course of the pilot, but we really think that there are a lot of other potential disabled cyclists out there who don't know about this program, um, who might be interested in this program. Um, and so uh, one of the other things that we're looking at um, as we're doing the evaluation is this program model, the question of transportation versus recreation. Um, because as you can probably tell, this is much more of a recreation program, right? This happens weekly, this happens, you know, people start and end their rides in the same place. Um, and, you know, we have heard from people who have said they really want to have uh, adaptive bike share available um, you know, at different places throughout the city. Um, as I mentioned, there are some logistical challenges there in terms of figuring out, um, you know, the, the benefit of having work staff on hand is that they can help people transfer and that they can um, fit people and that they're able to hold on to people's mobility devices. Um, but we haven't given up on the idea that there are other potential models out there as well that we can explore. Um, and so I think we're looking at um, maybe not substituting out one for the other, but what are the many more ways that we can expand cycling access for the disability community? One benefit of this current model is that we've seen this really strong sense of community form among you know, people who come back from week to week. Um, and then also, you know, there are folks um, who sometimes, uh, you know, folks who are not disabled who are coming into the park every week who started stopping by saying hi to the BORP staff and to the folks who are there um, and you know cyclists uh, who are able-bodied and so there is sort of this community uh, forming and this like wider interest happening around adaptive bike share we also we had an adaptive transportation event last fall where we also invited our um, scooter permittees to come bring their adaptive scooters so that folks could try out those scooters and then we also had uh, SFMT staff we were there to talk about other projects as well and so this is really sort of emerging as a hub um, where people can learn and try out um, adaptive uh, bike share. And so we're really excited about this program. We, you know, there's, a, there's still a lot of work to do to really uh, reach as many people as we want to reach. Um, but I think if you are in a position where you're considering doing something like this or you're thinking about whether or not it's worth it, I really encourage you to, to look into it more and to really go for it. Um, I think it's been hugely beneficial um, and it does really help um, with this, you know, coalitional community work where, you know, where disabled folks and able-bodied cyclists have the chance to connect and to uh, work together on similar issues um, and to form stronger political coalitions um, for safe streets. Um, so another way, and this is a slight shift, um, we can work to build coalitions, of course, um, is to ensure that cycling infrastructure is safe for disabled people who maybe don't cycle, disabled people who are pedestrians, um, because we have seen some resentment from the disability community about bike infrastructure. And some of that, we, what we hear is coming from people who have encountered 
bike lanes that are decreasing accessibility for disabled pedestrians. And so um, I'm going to talk just briefly and then mostly just share some resources uh, because there are a couple of really great design guides um, that I think people should look into. Um, here, this is a photo of a diagram. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what, what we're seeing here in a second. Um, but we have found uh, when we're designing bike lanes that it's really important to make sure that we are preserving access to the curb because some disabled folks need direct access to the curb. Being dropped off at the end of a block is not accessible enough. Um, that does not uh, meet people's needs. And so, and I think we've seen sometimes in some bike lane design, um, you know, by not considering disabled folks and not considering access, people are inadvertently reducing pedestrian access um, for disabled folks. And that, um, is on its uh, by itself a negative thing, and then also really does not help um, sort of a broader movement for better and safer infrastructure. Um, and so a couple of things here that we've learned, you, there's an image um, on the left here, a diagram that shows a, a mid-block crossing. Obviously this is like the kind of uh, design that you would have if you had like unlimited uh, street width and unlimited budget, but, um, there are other ways to incorporate, you know, mid-block crossings to make sure that if, you know, somebody is getting from, if it's a parking protected bike lane, or in this case, you know, curb, and then there's parking, um, that somebody is able to get from parking uh, more directly to um, the curb, uh, which is really essential. And then on the right here is uh, a more common design, um, but it's really one thing here that we know is that it's really important to have a wide enough buffer so that if somebody, when somebody is getting out, there's room for people to load, um, that there's room in some spaces for a ramp to deploy so that somebody would be able um, to get out in the buffer space and then have access to uh, a crosswalk and be able to, to reach the curb. Um, and so um, I'm not going to get too deep into this because we could have a really long conversation just about design, but I, I think this is just something that I wanna bring up that we hear a lot from the disability community as an issue and is something that I think uh, cyclists should be aware of. Um, and so um, I encourage you, we have some resources here. So uh, there's a resource called Getting to the Curb, which was developed by Walk SF in partnership with SFMTA and with disability organizations um, that is, uh, a, very, a pretty self-explanatory title. It's about uh, how to design bike lanes that are safe and that uh, enable disabled folks to get to the curb. Um, and then SFMDA, we have a guide called Building Blocks for Accessible Design. Um, and that also has some of the same similar content about the best way to build uh, accessible bicycle facilities. Um, this is really key. Um, and I encourage you to, to check these out. Um, and then finally, I'm going to share a little bit about my own experience. Um, I think it's, I, I really enjoyed hearing from Megan about her experience as a disabled cyclist. I think my experience is a little different. Um, I, I acquired my disability. Um, here's a, here's a photo of me. This is me, um, as a small child and, uh, with my, my new bike that I had just gotten, um, that I was very excited about. Um, and I acquired my disability, um, uh, as a teenager. And my disability is a chronic illness. And so I have limits on um, physical ability and energy levels and stamina. Um, I also um, have, uh, essentially, if, I, if my heart rate, my heart rate is uh, very readily raised. And so it is hard for me to bike on a standard cycle more than a few blocks without getting uh, really out of breath and lightheaded and dizzy. Um, and so I found for me personally that a standard cycle um, is not uh, accessible, at least uh, as my disability is in its current iteration. Um, that being said, I have tried e-bikes and while they don't always work for me, um, depending on how my, you know, with a variable disability, sometimes things work and sometimes things don't, um, I have found that sometimes they've been a really, really good option for me. It's really fun. I, I don't have to tell anybody in this room about how, uh, what a joy it is to be able to cycle. Um, and, and so for me, um, e-bikes uh, are a really, really wonderful um, asset that allow, that allow me to cycle. Um, and it is, I have to say, because the summit is, 
is in Oakland and I live in Oakland, I am uh, pretty bummed that the, the bike share system in Oakland does not have e-bikes because that would be a really ideal thing for me as somebody who is not going to use an e-bike on a regular basis, but would use one, um, you know, occasionally. Um, the other thing that has been really important for me as a disabled cyclist um, with physical limitations is safe infrastructure. And I think obviously this is really important for everybody, but I don't feel as confident in my like physical ability to get out of the way of a car in a dangerous situation um, or, you know, to quickly to quickly move, like to avoid, a, you know, a pothole or something like that. And so um, for me, that really discourages me and, and really limits the amount of cycling that I do because I'm just not willing to take those risks. Um, and so, you know, I think like when we're talking about things that benefit disabled cyclists, it's often things that also benefit um, non-disabled cyclists. Um, but I think is in many cases, especially relevant for disabled cyclists, um, the things that do and, and don't allow us to cycle. Um, and so uh, with that being said, I'm happy to elaborate on um, anything I've talked about um, in the discussion and the Q&A. Um, thank you very much. Here's uh, my contact information um, and looking forward to the discussion. Am I unmuted yet? Can you hear me on screen? Great. Yes, we can yes, hear you. Can hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Maddie. Um, thanks for sharing your wisdom. I definitely want to have some follow-up questions regarding the best way to build coalitions between cycling community and disabled community like you just mentioned. So I'm definitely looking forward to, to hear more on that. Before we get there, though, Anna, we see you on screen. Uh, thank hi, you for joining hi. us. <laughs> Great. Please. Can you hear me? Hear me? Yep. I can, hear me, I can hear me double. Okay. Okay. A little delay. <laughs> Yeah, take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, for those of you who may be joining online, I pasted some links in the chat, and um, hopefully those can be made available to folks in the room as well. Um, the first is a link to this presentation, uh, if that's helpful to you for later. So let me go ahead and start that. All right. And slide show. Wonderful. All right. I'm going to hope you all can see that. So my name is Anna Zivartz. I am here in Washington State. I'm the director of the Disability Mobility Initiative, which is a program of Disability Rights Washington. And um, I am a, a white woman in my 30s. I'm low vision and my eyes kind of bounce around. <laughs> I have a congenital condition called nystagmus. So um, I've had that my whole life. And this uh, photo on the screen is a photo of me as a, gosh, maybe five or six year old. That's my first bike learning how to ride a bike. I had a mom who was very physically active and sort of insisted that I learn to ride, um, even though it was a little challenging for me at first, I think more challenging perhaps than some other kids. Um, but biking was a skill that I, that I learned as a kid and it's a skill that has stayed with me um, you know, throughout my life and has been a big, big part of my life, honestly. Um, it has provided me a lot of transportation and mobility that I wouldn't have as someone who can't get a driver's license because I, I can't pass the vision test. And uh, so actually, this is some photos from this morning. Um, there are a lot of folks out there like me who are low vision, who do bike for transportation because we can't see well enough to drive a car, but we feel comfortable biking. Um, yes, perhaps, you know, I don't see potholes. I run into things occasionally, but I feel really safe doing it, um, safe enough to bike with my kid. This is a photo of me this morning um, with a group of other parents. Uh, most of us have e-cargo bikes. And uh, quite a few of us here uh, in this photo are, are low vision and cannot drive a car. And yet, you know, biking for us, it does, does provide a fair amount of um, mobility and access. We were actually riding this morning with a council member. Um, she's in the middle in the blue puffy jacket in the center photo, um, trying to get her to help us improve uh, some bike infrastructure in Southeast Seattle. Uh, the city is considering widening a road, and um, it's our main bike route right now, and we'd like to see it done in a way that creates safe infrastructure for those of us who are biking through this area with our kids. Um, so I come to this work, uh, I was a video producer for many years, and, and I got hired as the lead video producer at Disability Rights Washington back in 2018. Um, our video team was called Rooted in Rights, and in that role, we were hired by NACTO to create a video on disabled bikers. And so Tiffany, unfortunately, isn't here with us today, 
but she's that's how I met her and actually Megan as well, um, who are in this video. And I, I encourage you to watch it. If you have a minute, I, um, it's available on YouTube. It's also available on the Rooted in Rights website. If you Google disabled people ride bikes, uh, it should come up. Bikes and trikes and tandems and recumbents. And it's just a really joyous celebration of all the different ways di people with different kinds of disabilities ride. Um, and it really uh, helped me, um, you know, there is, there is a lot of stigma, I think, in the disability community around biking. Um, and um, it felt difficult for me to navigate that when I um, started becoming more active in disability activism, because, it, you know, biking for me has always been something that provided a lot of freedom and is, is a big part of my identity. Um, but recognizing that, you know, it isn't available to everyone and that things that we do as cyclists or as advocates for cycling infrastructure can actively make things more difficult for people with other kinds of disabilities, as Megan and Maddie have talked about. And so um, this video is a way for me to sort of uh, help connect and, and recognize that, that biking can be part of um, disability and, um, and just that, 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 it, that there, are, there are ways to do that and celebrate uh, what is possible um, if we're doing it in an inclusive way. I want to talk a little bit about some of the other work we do at Disability Rights Washington in the Disability Mobility Initiative around mobility, because that sort of recognition with that NACCO video, and um, understanding that there was power in those of us who bike for transportation and bike for joy and bike for um, bike for mental health, um, you know, that, 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 um, that power of us coming together um, and having disability be what connected us really uh, could be translated into creating uh, more sustainable and equitable transportation systems more broadly. And so in my current role as the director of the Disability Mobility Initiative, we are busy organizing um, non-drivers in Washington state. And we define that pretty broadly as anyone, you don't have to identify as having a disability. Many people um, don't identify as having a disability for a lot of different reasons. Um, but you know, if, if you don't have access to a car, if that's not something that's, that's regularly accessible to you, we've collected stories from people um, who, who identify as non-drivers for our story map. And to date, it's got 200 stories from every single legislative district in our state. Those stories are available in one of the links that I shared. And um, what we did was we interviewed people and asked about you know, how they get around and what the biggest barriers are to their, um, to their transportation uh, and, and mobility to get where they need to go in their communities. And um, it was also exciting to be able to connect with more disabled cyclists through this project, people that I um, didn't know were out there. This is uh, Cody Shane. He lives in Chihuahua, Washington, which is way north of Spokane, very small town, very rural uh, community. And he um, can't drive, um, but uses this tricycle. Uh, to get around and um, around his town. And then when he needs to go further, he rides a bus uh, to get to nearby communities. And when I was visiting him there in Chihuahua, we started to notice, well, he pointed out to me and I took some pictures, but the, the infrastructure um, is really a challenge because you know Chihuahua is a small town, but the main road through town is a, is a state highway. And that state highway, um, there's only one light in, in the whole length of the town, which is a couple miles. And so for him to get from one side of town to the other, from the grocery store to the library where he works or to his house, he has to go way out of his way down to this light. And then um, the light's super fast. Uh, he's expected to walk across the crosswalk and the crosswalk was really faded. And so we got, we got our state department transportation to repaint that crosswalk. But um, I think this is you know, an example of how the work we're doing, um, trying to improve the mobility of those of us who can't drive is also really connected to the work around um, talking about how highways and the infrastructure we've created for cars has cut and divided our communities and created not only um, difficulty in people getting from one place to another in their community, but also you know, the public health um, problems that having those uh, high-speed roads through communities creates. And so, um, you know, this, this, this road uh, through this town in Chihuahua is slated to be widened um, right south of there. And so they're anticipating even more traffic, even uh, and especially um, freight traffic coming from the border in Canada to come down through the center of this town. And just, uh, it, it brings us to um, our work um, in, in really trying to center the needs of people who can't um, can't drive, can't get from point A to point B, 
um, and have uh, these barriers created when we are prioritizing highway infrastructure. These are some screenshots from our Transportation for Access for Everyone Washington State story uh, research paper, which is what we developed from the story map last summer. Again, I've shared a link for that and I encourage you to check it out. It includes a lot of recommendations, very specific recommendations around curb cuts and sidewalks and crossings, um, as well as broader in, in, uh, recommendations around inclusion. Uh, one of our big takeaways has been the need to include people with disabilities um, in planning departments, uh, in decision-making bodies. And so um, it, it's great to see folks like Maddie getting invited into spaces and, and being in the rooms where these decisions are getting made, because I think that's what it's gonna take to create a more inclusive transportation system. One of our tactics, and um, until we get there, until we get in the room uh, and get into those decision-making uh, positions has been uh, our Week Without Driving Challenge, which is where we invite elected leaders and transportation agency folks to spend a week trying to get around their communities without access to a vehicle, um, without driving themselves in a vehicle. They're, they're welcome to get rides from other people, from their friends, from their family. Um, and we did that last fall. We're gonna do it again this fall. And it really helped, I think, uh, our elected officials in, in the state of Washington start to recognize some of the barriers that exist in their communities uh, when they try to not only just take the easy trips um, in, on the bus or on a bike, but actually every trip they needed to take. So yeah, there's some uh, quick notes around inclusive transportation planning. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up because I want us to have a bit uh, more discussion time. Um, and yeah, this is, this is linking back to our work with Front and Centered. It's an environmental justice coalition here in Washington state where we really are trying to tie the work we do around accessible communities to larger conversations around climate and environmental justice uh, to make sure that the communities that we're working towards really work for everyone. Uh, and that is my presentation. Thank you. Let's see if I can stop this. There we go. Thank you all. You can hear me okay, right there on screen? Okay. Um, thank you, Anna, and sorry for mispronouncing your name first, um, but thank you for, yes, sharing your, your great insights and, um, yeah, everything that you do. Um, I, I guess my first question, we have about 25 minutes, and I definitely want you all to ask questions as well, but one of the first ones I have, which I think you all touched on and maybe can elaborate on, is what can we, as, like, able-bodied cycling bike community do to not just reach out but form those coalitions to make the connections to like build off of this this first panel at cow bike which i want to give a shout out to bike east bay uh dave campbell on the summit actually suggested um this session for the summit and it wasn't even on cow bike's radar in that point so definitely i see bike east bay in the room so i definitely want to give a shout out to that but what can not just state coalitions like cow bike but all of us do and i and i know you all can maybe elaborate a little bit more on that i would say, I would say the first the first, the first the, thing the first thing, thing is just not just being defensive when somebody points out that something is ableist and you know i'm sure that folks who are pointing out other systemic oppressions have the same thing that goes on that the first the first um inclination somebody has because we're all trained into these systems is to defend the system and so we just have this knee-jerk reaction to go no i'm not doing that no it's not you know and you just need to ex to to you know sit back listen and take in that the person might have a point because once you do that you're more able to see what might be going on that you can work on so that would be the very first thing i would mention Um, I would say um, I, I appreciate that, Megan. And I think also um, building on that, that just know that it's not always straightforward or easy. Sometimes it really is the work of access and building access can be messy. And sometimes it can feel like, or there can be conflicting needs. Um, and so I think sometimes uh, my experience is that, you know, when cycling advocates first hear about disabled cyclists, sometimes, you know, they're, they're really excited and they think like the needs of disabled cyclists are really aligned with other cyclists. And then sometimes when it gets a little messy and disabled cyclists need things that, you know, maybe, you know, take up more space or have, need more funding or different kinds of funding, um, or, you know, as I was mentioning, when there's some cycling infrastructure that 
might be taking away access for other people with other types of disabilities, that, you know, that, that is just, that is part of the process. And so not sort of giving up or, you know, throwing up your hands when it feels like it's, it's complicated and messy and really just trying to embrace that, like, if we all are able to build relationships and build trust, we can sort of work through some of these complications and these, you know, messy issues together. Um, and, you know, if there's more trust between the disability community and the cycling community, then I think people's first instincts, you know, I hear from disabled people all the time who say like, oh, you know, the cyclists, they get everything and we get nothing, you know? And that is, I think that's not, you know, inherent, that's not true, but it can feel that way for some people. And especially I think, you know, disabled folks have been waiting for access for a long time, right? Like the ADA was passed in 1990 and there are still, you know, you go outside and there are broken sidewalks and missing curb ramps and all of these, you know, really basic infrastructure pieces for disabled folks that people need to get around just on a really daily, on a daily basis that don't um, exist for people. And so when they feel like they see like cyclists you know, and we know that like, we know that cars are getting all the money. We know, like, we know that the people in this room know that, but I think like, you know, when you're in car culture and you aren't necessarily uh, around transportation planners and advocates all the time, that's not how you're seeing it. And so I think there's also, there's a need for uh, cycling advocates to be, to be patient and to really try to build those relationships with disabled people so that that trust can exist. Yeah, I'll add one thing to it. all the brilliant things you all shared. Um, this is Anna. So I, you know, I, I think there is, once people realize there's a power in having the disability community sort of endorse and sign on and be in, in your active transportation coalition, there is a tendency to want to tokenize um, and symbolically get disabled people, you know, as part of your coalition without actually making changes or making enough changes uh, to, to, to have, you know, our, our needs met. And I see this, you know, most blatantly, like anytime there's a contract for new scooter companies to come into Seattle, the scooter companies all come to town and they want to meet with us and they want us to sign on and give them letters of support for their, you know, for the, the competition that they're going to have to go into to get, get the um, to, to be able to deploy scooters in Seattle. And, and it just, it feels like it, it's very obvious in that case, right, that we're being tokenized. <laughs> um, and it's less obvious in other situations, but I, I would encourage you, as you would any community, um, to be really careful about um, just asking people for their symbolic or token um, participation. And, and especially, you know, with images, um, and you know, trying to show that you're a diverse coalition, like you would with with uh, racial diversity as well. Like, are you going to just stick a photo of you know someone um, in a wheelchair or uh, you know a hand cycle on your materials without actually meaningfully engaging with the disability community? It's often pretty transparent that that's what's happening when that happens. So um, it's almost you know, to, to, it, yeah, what everyone said about taking the time to really build those relationships and making sure that you are truly listening. curious what can government do you know whether it's at the city county or state level and I know you mentioned a few examples on a, in in Washington what the state is doing but I was wondering if Megan or Maddie you can say any more like what would you like to see or what could be done at the governmental level that's not currently happening now oh gosh there's so much I mean part of the problem that I see is that you know as Maddie was pointing out First of all, disabled people have been around a lot longer than since 1990, okay? We didn't suddenly appear on the scene in 1990. So, you know, accessibility could have come much, much sooner than that. But even with ADA having been signed into law in 1990, uh, most institutions, including our own government, have not really adhered to it. And government also has like some sec uh, section 504 and 508, you know, uh, things that... so. You know, for instance, you see, you see itself. You know, that's the problem here. Is you see is part of our state government, uh, and they don't adhere to even the in the law. By the way, ADA is not like you haven't. You know, you don't get to run across the finish line and celebrate after you meet ADA. ADA is the minimum. It is the minimum level. 
So it's hard for me to see. It's not that government can't help, but I feel like there needs to be this huge cultural change because when everything comes from law and compliance, you know, it's kind of like I've, I've used this analogy before. It's sort of like, a you know, <laughs> this com comedic routine about, you know, minimum wage where it's like, you know, I would pay you less except the law won't let me, right? <laughs> you know, so if it comes from compliance, people are always going to be shooting low and it has to come from care about people in your community. And by the way, if you happen to be able, it's also care for yourself because this is a really easy club to join. In fact, most cyclists should know this because you're really just one dooring away from being disabled. So you're taking care of yourself by making sure that your community is accessible. And I think, uh, you know, certainly if you want to, again, to repeat this, like if you want to join UC Access Now in terms of pressing UC, that would be definitely a government thing that you could make change. But I think uh, it's a hard, that it, it, it's definitely easier on the local level. And I think like, for instance, what Anna, Anna is doing with um, a disability uh, mobility initiative in terms of, um, getting government officials to really experience what it's like to get around without a car is a, a brilliant move. Thanks, Megan, um, uh, for, for sharing all of that. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm working at the local government level. And so I think um, what I would like to see, I think, you know, I think local government has a really important role to play in, you know, we're designing and implementing a lot of this cycling infrastructure. And so ensuring that, you know, that bike lanes that we build are wide enough for, you know, if somebody is riding a, an adaptive trike, right? Like, you know, making sure that the, the structure, the infrastructure that we build is accessible for disabled cyclists and that it also is accessible for everybody else. Um, I also think, you know, government has a role to play. We have these sort of Interactions and uh, Anna mentioned uh, scooter companies. You know, we have this like private mobility, uh, you know, movement over the past like decade or so um, that has come into our cities. And so I think government also has a really important role to play in ensuring that private entities who come into our communities are uh, providing access, are, are, are ha do have adaptive options. You know, and I think there are different ways to do that. You can also like potentially they could pay into funds that would fund other accessible transportation. Like I think there are different approaches, but I do think government has an important role to play in holding the line there and not just ensuring that private mobility can come into communities without engaging with the disability community in a meaningful way, because we've also seen that like sometimes uh, emerging mobility can come into communities and decrease access, um, you know, by having like you know, scooters or dockless bikes uh, blocking sidewalks. And so I think that is a role that I, I want to see uh, local governments really take a, a strong stance there. And of course, I want to see uh, other local governments implementing adaptive bike share programs as well, or working with uh, the, the bike share in their cities to have adaptive bike share. Yeah, this is Anna. I'll just add one, one sort of thing that we've been Part of the way we're thinking about our work as the Disability Mobility Initiative is, <laughs> despite our title, Disability Mobility Initiative, we are really trying to organize more intersectionally uh, across folks who may not identify as disabled. And um, that, that starts to you know, become challenging because historically, right, the protections from the ADA, it's like you have to identify, it has to be about disability, you have to identify as disabled. Um, and it, if, it, if it's, harming you as a disabled person just as much as it's harming someone who's not disabled, you don't get it fixed. It has to harm you more. Um, one way we see that is, you know, you can sue if there's not curb ramps, but you can't sue if there's not a sidewalk because the courts have found that, well, not having a sidewalk hurts everyone, uh, not just disabled people. And so how do we, how do we move? I mean, first of all, I want someone to challenge that, that part of <laughs> um, the law, but how, how can we move beyond these legal, this, this framework of sort of special things for special people and start, um, uh, how, do, how, do we, how do we get beyond that so that it, it doesn't have to be about self-identifying us with a disability, um, that we can create systems that really are more inclusive um, beyond that historic legal framework. Yeah, I have tons more questions, but I'd rather have you all ask them. So just 
I see some hands and I see three, just, just go that way. And there might be some online as well, so hopefully we'll have, we'll have some time. But Eris, please start us off. Okay, great, thank you. Um, it's been, uh, uh, Megan said something about we're all only one uh, dooring away from being disabled. You all may also just be some years away from being disabled. I have some hearing impairment, and of all the sessions here at this conference, this has been the one that's been the most difficult for me to hear because of the sound quality over Zoom and the lack of captioning. Um, and then there's also the thing that, you know, people with disabilities aren't all one thing, right? So if I were profoundly deaf, like my daughter-in-law or one of my other cycling friends and said, okay, I'm deaf, I need a, an ASL interpreter for the conference, I'm sure that would have happened. Uh, but I often in events get treated like, oh, you're just, you're just being a cranky. And now you got, okay, uh, that you're just being a cranky old lady always, all the time, asking people to either shut up or speak up or, or move or, or, you know, do some other things here. So I want to tell all of you what you can all do to make things easier for people with hearing impairments, at least, um, especially since so much of our lives are on Zoom now. Fucking enable captioning. That is so simple to do and... Yet, the number of public meetings and company meetings and stuff that I've been on where nobody knows how to enable the captioning. We've been doing Zoom for two years now, people. Get with it. Um, if you are on a meeting with Zoom, use a fucking microphone so that people can hear you well, right? Because if the room is bouncy or you're too, you're too far away from your laptop, then the sound is bad for people listening on it. Um, so, sorry, I'm being all cranky because I've missed a good chunk of the actual presentation today um, because of those, those lacks. Um, I guess I'll stop my little tirade right there, but um, to just, you know, be some awareness that they're, like Anna said, I wouldn't identify as disabled. It's, it's not, you know, the way I think of myself in the world, but it is an issue in, in different places and, and that there are a lot of other folks around with um, disabilities that maybe you can't even see or know about um, that, that we want to find to accommodate. Thanks. Thank you, Eris, and thank you for keeping us accountable too. And you know, there was a, a special captioning that we had a system set up. We thought we'd get in place. Unfortunately, it did not work. So. Super apologize for that. Here's the next question. Hi. Um, I really took in what you said about the necessity for cultural change, um, especially at the local level. And so I wanted to run by a situation to see if you've encountered anything like this and have any recommendations about how to deal with it. So in our town, uh, the city's being sued because there are... are um, there are folks who are unhoused who are taking up uh, a, a sidewalk and there's a person who has a wheelchair who uses this sidewalk on a regular basis and doesn't have access. And so the staff has recommended that there be a quick build bulb out in order to address those competing needs. And it seems like okay, good way to go. It's gonna be pretty expensive. There are folks that are very, very unfriendly to unhoused folks and are pretty resentful about the use of the money. However, these competing needs need to be uh, um, addressed. And while our city is working hard to find housing for unhoused people, this is where they are right now and this person in a wheelchair still needs access. So I don't know if any of you have had a similar kind of not necessarily with competing needs. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. Some, some, some of what you some said, what cut, you said out, cut out, but, but uh, you know, if I, you know, if I, 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 I've, I've certainly I've noticed, certainly noticed, sorry, I'm getting, sorry, an, I'm echo. getting an echo. Uh, uh, I've certainly noticed that because people who are houseless are between a rock and a hard place in terms of where they can be, which is if they, you know, camp out on private property, they're certainly going to get in immediate trouble, right? But when people try to camp out on places that are public property, then that is also an issue. So 
definitely, you know, as you are already pointing out, the problem ultimately is that our society has failed people and is not providing people with homes. However, what I would ask is, to what extent have the houseless people been approached directly and made aware of this issue and asked if they can come up with, you know, the right amount of space to pass by. And the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, a lot of a lot of folks, my impression of, of a lot of houseless communities is that, that there's, when they've been in a certain space for a while, they develop their own sort of self-governance methods. And so if you, if you go to folks and you sort of impose something on them without actually consulting them, it's not likely to be really successful. So you, what you have to do is, you know, you've got these competing access needs that there are people in the community who presumably are not houseless, who use wheelchairs and need to get through. Uh, and then you also have a houseless community. And by the way, I need to point out that a lot of disabled people end up houseless, okay? SSI and SSDI are paying what would have been cost of living maybe in 1970, and they have not updated at all. So I know I myself am, you know, I feel like I'm about two or three weeks away from homelessness at any given time. Uh, and I would end up having to live out of my car if I still had my car. And if I lost that, I, I truly would be on the street. So there are a lot of disabled people in the houses community as well, some of whom use wheelchairs, by the way. So you may find a more sympathetic ear there if you just approach people as people and say, look, there's this issue here that it's public property and we want, you know, we're, we're not trying to make it so that you can't use it at all, but we need to make it so that other folks who have wheelchair uh, who have mobility needs can get through as well. That would be my suggestion, and I'm sure others here have other things to say. I think that's a great suggestion, and I also think it it speaks to how uh, so frequently, you know, this is something we talk about in the disability community about people making decisions for us without us, and I think the same thing is true for the unhoused community. And so, you know, it's very possible that nobody has approached uh, the, the unhoused folks who are in this particular on this particular sidewalk because it simply didn't occur to them, um, even though it seems like it could potentially be a really uh, viable solution. Um, and then I think the other thing that I want to mention um, is just that people do sometimes use um, disabled access as like a cudgel against other needs. So you will see sometimes sweeps carried out in the name of accessibility, even though, as Megan said, many unhoused people are themselves disabled. We've also seen this with people trying to close down polling places um, because they didn't meet accessibility standards. And when it's when that's done, obviously we want polling places to be accessible, but when people are closing uh, things on a widespread level, it's pretty transparent that it's not happening because they care about accessibility because closing a polling place does not improve accessibility for anybody. Um, and so that people really are just using access um, as a way to further their own agenda without improving accessibility. And so I just think like that's an important thing to watch out for when you're in these kinds of situations. Yeah, I think you guys said it all. <laughs> Nothing else to add there. Okay, now it does. I think we have time for one or two more questions, but I know Ginger here. Had to... Thanks. Um, hey, this is Ginger Jui, Executive Director with Bike East Bay. And uh, I just first want to say I'm extremely passionate about uh, mobility for people with disabilities, and I worked for a number of years at the BORP Adaptive Cycling Center, um, and also made the, the film about blind tandem cycling that I saw. Y'all put a little screen grab from there. Um, and uh, something that I run into at Bike East Bay and our cycling advocacy a lot is, um, you know, working a disability community and having a lot of the conversations about, like, street infrastructure really be narrowly, uh, access on you know protected bike lanes or other inf uh, bike infrastructure um, having that conversation like focus very narrowly on like access for um, uh, wheelchair vans um, and while that's all and good I've always felt that that 
serves, you know, it really serves the needs of one portion of the disability commu community and um, doesn't address like a huge amount of the mobility barriers in the community, including like number one, income access, like a very small number of people are able to have wheelchair vans <laughs> anyway. And something that has blown my mind with this presentation, Anna, was um, your framing of the argument around just organizing non-drivers, uh, which seems to serve a much, you know, a, a majority portion of, of the community of people with disabilities and have so much more like intersectional um, organizing involved. So Anna, I was interested in hearing more about like how you came to this framing, like what was the genesis of it, and if there's anyone you can connect me to here in California the, or the Bay Area. Sure, yeah, this is Anna. So I, um, my background before I started doing work in the disability community, I mean, I've been disabled my whole life, but again, didn't identify um, actually until my son was born and had the same eye condition. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to stop being ashamed of who I am. Uh, long story there, but I was working in labor and labor organizing with, um, you know, service worker unions, uh, hospitality unions. So a lot of low income workers many of whom, you know, would be considered disabled under some definitions, but weren't self-identifying, right? And so um, I saw the work that, that we, you know, the, the things that I was hearing from folks in Washington state around access. And we, um, as Disability Rights Washington, every year we survey the community uh, to, our, to determine our priorities. We're federally funded, and so we have to do that. And transportation is always up there. But I think what happens in the disability community and in every community um, it's the folks with the most resources and, you know, the folks who can afford wheelchair accessible vans who end up uh, determining um, priorities. And so I really intentionally wanted to try to see what would happen if we said, okay, yes, that those are all needs. But what about everyone else who can't afford that, who doesn't work? In, in our case, like there's a lot of folks, um, Microsoft has a great, you know, hiring program for folks with disabilities, but not everyone is working at Microsoft and earning those kind of salaries. And so, um, you know, really going uh, intentionally looking at um, folks who are low income, folks from, you know, from communities that don't speak English as a first language, um, you know, our tribal communities, what, what are the transportation needs there uh, and starting from that place. Uh, and I don't have a California contact for you, um, but I'm working on, on trying to, to start to have this conversation more nationally. Because I think it is a powerful way to frame things. And yes, it doesn't, you know, include everyone's needs. But I think by starting to center the needs of the folks who have the least resources, the least power, um, that's and, and doing that sort of in this intersectional way is, is a model for moving uh, forward. So anybody have a quick question or shall we end there? We're, we're at time. So that sounds good. Thank you so much, Anna, <laughs> Megan, Maddie, for your time. We'll sign off now and thank you everyone for attending.